thank uh, Pastor Jackler and, and uh, not just my son for inviting me. Uh, I feel like it's really an honor for me to, to speak at, at particularly this department and this university, given his his long history in, in uh, developing medical devices. As a matter of fact, one the, there's a, a problem in designing medical devices. You you run into and patenting something called prior art. Prior art eliminates your patent because somebody else has gotten something that has similar uh, uh, features to it. And we had a little sidebar conversation where I had to tell him that his prior art got the way of my new art. So, uh, <laughs> <laughs> cool. anyhow, design around. Yeah. <laughs> we, we, well, we got creative. So, and it's one of the things that, that I'm going to talk about. Well, you know. Um, Periodically, I'll get uh, otolaryngologists uh, who will say, you know, I got this great idea. Uh, can you help me? You've been through this over and over again. The first thing I say is, don't tell me what it is. Okay? Because when you have a great idea, you want to tell everybody about it. Uh, I get to talk to you tonight about the last 35 years uh, of my career in medical device innovation. I have uh, moved along. I, I filed two months ago, my 43rd patent. And so it's been the last couple of years when I didn't have to see patients anymore. It's opened the doors to a lot of things away from uh, laryngectomy and speech therapy. But um, let's go to the next slide. We, we all love the, uh, the uh, disclosure statements. They're very important. Uh, you will find that I, I won't use any commercial tags. In fact, a number of the things that I'm going to show you in this short talk uh, aren't even assigned any place yet. They're still pipeline. So uh, let's go to the next slide. And um, <clears throat> as I started to think about this talk, how, how should I roll it out? What should I talk about? And uh, for me, it's the first step is identifying what is an unmet need, something that you need to fix. And you know, there, there are things that you'd like to fix that, that aren't frequently encountered as problems, you're not going to go, in my experience, go very far with those. You need something that is fre uh, frequently encountered problem. Otherwise, you never get to the other points below. Uh, it needs to be technically solvable. And um, you need to have, it unfortunately, needs to have sufficient commercial potential. Otherwise, when you get into some of these projects, they don't know where because you can't afford to do these things yourself. You can't build molds and bring things forward. You have to, you have to uh, be connected to the, to the commercial entity. Um, and I believe things need to be patentable. They need to be patentable because you can't go to the commercial entity with something that's not patentable. Uh, there are great ideas uh, that, that come forward from people that never get patented that get donated to the public domain, and I think that that's really great. As a matter of fact, the very first version of the voice processes, when Singer and I started together in 1978, is in the public domain. It was donated. It was never a, a product that came to patent. So uh, let's go to the next slide. Uh, what I'd like to do before I get to contracts and patents and, and tell you about some of the, I've made the mistakes already. And this talk is to try to avoid mistakes for some of you that may have inventive um, uh, minds. Uh, if you're in a university setting like this, and you, you are employed by the university, I don't know how that works. I'm sure that Dr. Good could, could uh, uh, give us a lot of direction there. But I know when I was at the VA, uh, the VA owned anything I thought about and anything I brought forward. Um, so. I know if you're with corporations and probably universities, it gets a little bit murkier as to ownership. Uh, but I'd like to share with you, before I get to contracts and patents, some ongoing things, um, a couple of which are already out and uh, available, and some things that are very early in the pipeline. The, these are all, these six particular unmet needs are unmet needs that, that I have a very strong relationship with, an understanding of, and a passion for. Long before uh, I got involved in laryngectomy rehabilitation, 
uh, for voice, and Mark Singer and I started to work together. I had an interest in what to do with patients on a ventilator with a fully inflated cuff tracheostomy tube. And I designed some stuff for, I was particularly interested in paralyzed patients. They can't write, they can't gesture, they can't communicate. And I developed some kind of Mickey Mouse now systems for those folks that never went any place, and it's part of the learning to get to where I am today. So I'm going to show you uh, some work that emerged just a, a year or two ago, and that was making it possible for patients on a ventilator with a fully inflated cuff to speak with their own larynx. In other words, you're going to get all the air in through the trach tube, and somehow all the exhalation is going to get to the patient's larynx despite having a fully inflated cuff. Uh, the second one is management of pharyngocutaneous fistula. And um, I know probably out in this area of the country, a fistula is probably a fairly rare complication. <laughs> but in the Midwest, I can tell you, we have them. And uh, they need to be maybe managed a little bit differently. And I know this is a long way from speech, but I've been seeing head and neck patients for a long, long time. And uh, so I have some thoughts and some things that are emerging right now as another management approach for these folks. Septal button, fit and insertion. I don't know how many otolaryngologists that I've talked to say, no, I, I don't even talk about septal buttons because number one, they don't fit right. They slide around and move in the nose. And number two, they're difficult to put in. Sometimes you can get them, depending on where the perf is, you can get them in, put in in the office, but sometimes you have to take the patient to the door to get them in. So that's a challenge, and I can tell you, there are still people in the last year or so writing about taking a mold of a perforation and building. It's just crazy. So I'm going to show you a simple thought. Uh, again, not rolled out, but close to rolling out. Um, tracheoesophageal voice process is fluctuation in length. It's a problem that I've seen for years, where your patient will come in, the prosthesis will be re retracted back in the tissue because they've had some event where the wall has swollen. We have patients that two or three times a year, they'll have this flare-up that'll occur over a two or three day period, uh, comes on pretty rapidly, and they show up and their prosthesis is retracted back in the tissue. You gotta get it out, you gotta put in a measure, put in a longer prosthesis. Within a week or two, they're back in your office, and it's too long, okay, and the flare-up's over. So some thoughts there and, and some innovation there. Um, stricture in esophageal patients. I've watched this for all of my career with head and neck uh, patients, uh, particularly the laryngectomy patients. Uh, I think we're all fairly familiar with the fact that um, some of our patients get dilated two or three times a year, some even more, some not at all, but quite a few need to get dilated. and. Um, so it's a trip to, to an OR someplace, and it's a so it's a facility fee. And secondly, um, it's a, an anesthesia. Uh, my patient told me, God, I, I, with a voice prosthesis, I talk worse now than I did before I got dilated. I'm swallowing worse two or three days later, they get better. Because we all know it's a, it's a fairly break it open, fairly traumatic uh, management procedure. Well, there may be another way to do that. and. Uh, I'll expand on that. And then uh, probably the thing, one of the things that I'm most interested in right now is uh, ventilator-associated pneumonia. And um, uh, I think we know that most patients that, uh, that experience ventilator-associated pneumonia it's within the first 42 hours or 48 hours, 72 hours after being intubated uh, orally. And, so I'm interested in going to share some things that are in the pipeline design-wise in that area. So next slide. So um, I'm just going to show you a, a single picture of what the problems are now. Inability to speak on a ventilator with a fully inflated cuff. Yes, if a patient can have a cuff leak or a partial leak, some of that air can escape by the cuff. But you've got a lot of patients that need a ventilatory support that is a full cuff inflation, and so there's no air leak and there's no speech. There's a way around that. Next, this one, I think we all know this, uh, pharyngo, pharyngocutaneous fistula. We talked about that. Uh, next, uh, septal perforation. We know that one. Next. And this is a, a retracted voice prosthesis. 
patient comes in on it, he says, over the weekend, Saturday, I start to swell, and by Monday or Tuesday, I come in, and it's drawn back in the tissue, and, and it's a little bit of work. So, and five is uh, a stricture, esophageal stricture, uh, particularly on a laryngectomy patient, and number six is, I think you're, you've all seen this, as you've taken endotracheal tubes out to convert somebody to a tracheostomy. Is, um, you know, people are worried about, uh, well, because what you're going to see is not only a proposal, but a patented, the, the patent is already issued for me for this, and that is an inner cannula and an endotracheal tube. Disposable inner cannula. I don't know why there isn't an inner cannula in an endotracheal tube. It just escapes me. So, um, because there's some new ways to make things. And so, and, and people, uh, some people that I've consulted with have said, well, you know, if you're going to have an inner cannula, it's going to have to be really thin because we don't want to lose ID of the tube. That's so critical to people. But what do you think the ID's like here? <laughs> okay? So, and here is all of this stuff sitting right above the airway. Okay? And so, why do we have early onset ventilator associated pneumonia? Well, that's a huge contributor to it. So, Let's go next. So, uh, after you've identified an unmet need, you need to define the solution uh, to fix that or, or to solve that. And I believe, at least it's been my experience, that to be able to define a solution, you have to have an extremely comprehensive understanding of all aspects of the problem that you're going to solve. You might be thinking, well, what does a speech pathologist know about septal perforation? So what does he know about uh, ventilator-associated pneumonia? I'm a little different speech pathologist. And I, I think I'll share that with you as we get some of these. So uh, I've experienced taking on, trying to design something to fix a problem without a full understanding of the problem. And I wasn't successful. So I've learned, at least for me, I have to thoroughly understand the problem in all aspects before I can start to, to try to think of a, for me, mechanical solution. Next slide. So uh, let's look at the ability to speak on a ventilator, again, with a fully inflated cuff, OK? We want the, the ventilator to inflate the lungs and, and not lose any air. And on exhalation, we want all the exhaled air to go up, up through the larynx for true laryngeal voicing, OK? And um, that's, that's the definition of what we need to do. So next slide, um, we'll show you what a typical patent drawing looks like. So we've got a, a, a tracheostomy tube now, standard tracheostomy tube, except right above the cuff, one millimeter above the, the cuff. In fact, the, the band that glues the cuff on is turned inside the cuff so we can put a fenestration right above the cuff. Number one, because most surgeons, physicians will say, oh, sorry, don't want to hear any more about that. We don't use fenestrated tubes. Because fenestrated tubes cause granulation tissue. Well, do a real exhaustive search in the literature. You're going to find that that's not well documented. But nonetheless, the fenestration, which is about this large, is right above the cuff. You have a cuff that's propping the fenestration off the wall even if it were to come in contact. So uh, now at about a two-year uh, interval with where we put the fenestration, there's not been a, a report of granulation tissue. And the, the tube is, this trach tube is, it's hard to go up against a Shiley and a Portex. That's what we're trying to do. And um, this is now in 87 mm. countries. So we're starting to get some, some traction. Anyhow. Um, it's a standard trick tube with a fenestration right above the cuff. And it has a standard inner cannula, just like a Shiley or anybody else. But it has some other inner cannulas that you can convert things. And so um, you can take out the standard inner cannula. Next slide. And this is a soft silicone cannula. And right here, which is the region that sits right beneath the fenestration, we call this a bubble valve. It is paper thin, tough, but paper thin. And this is a flat valve. So during pressurized ventilation, 
as the air comes through, the bubble balloons up and seals the fenestration so you don't lose any air. And the flap valve opens. On exhalation, the flap valve closes, the bubble collapses, and the air ramps up and goes out through the fenestration. And the patient's able to speak. Next slide. This is the same concept. There's the fenestration, inhalation, bubble valve goes up, flap valve opens, exhalation is just the reverse, but there are no moving parts per se. This flap valve is integral with the silicone tube itself. Next slide. And that makes Do you want to talk? Is it time? <laughs> okay. I'm just going to take the inner cannula out. Regular inner cannula out. Speech cannula in. How's that, Jess? Hi. Hey. How are you? How are you? Now, not a good speech sample. This this young woman was in a severe motor vehicle accident, and so she's quite dysarthric. I'll tell you what, I wish I had time to show you the whole clip in sync voice. It's an amazing piece. So this is possible, and um, it is something that is being used by patients. Uh, in various centers around the world. Next slide. So, um, fistulas, okay? What's the definition? Well, we'd like to eliminate ligates of secretions from that fistula without plugging or obturating the, the fistula, okay? And uh, doing that with soft flanges and an elastomeric cord that is eight French in between, and I started hand making these probably nine or ten years ago for fistulas in our practice. And then through voice restoration, clinicians and stuff, various docs around the country said, well, I understand you've got this and can you make me one? And fortunately, I kept all of that data on all of the, all of the surgeons around the country that I made fistula devices for. Because once we got to the FDA, thinking that we'd get through the FDA on a similarity to other devices like a salivary bypass tube for fistula control or flanges on a voice prosthesis, the committee said, well, you know, I think we'd like to have some specific clinical data. I said, I just happened to have some of that. So I went back to all the surgeon friends of mine around the country, and I said, here's a data form. Will you go back in your charts? and answer all these questions about your patients for the FDA. And the FDA took that retrograde study and, and uh, approved this device. Um, next slide. Can I ask you a question yeah, about the previous sure? one? I'm sorry to yeah, interrupt. So I was going to ask how you got the other one past the FDA. What Which kind one? of studies did you need? Oh, like with the flapper valve yeah, and all yeah, that? The speech the cannula. Off. Yeah, that trait tube, that trait tube has a second cannula, which is a suction inner cannula. So, Rather than having a suction line on the outer cannula, which gets plugged up, we have a suction line on the inner cannula. If it gets plugged up, you can just take it out and flush it, or just throw it away because it's disposable. And the suctioning takes place through the fenestration. And where the secretions sit? One millimeter above the cuff. So um, what happened there, FDA wasn't interested in the suction inner cannula, the regular cannula, the outer cannula. They wanted to know the safety and efficacy of the valved speech cannula. And uh, they also helped me design the study, said, this is what we want. And they said, we don't care where you collect the data. And so I have, uh, from voice restoration, a lot of friends in a lot of countries. And the study was done in three large hospitals in Turkey and um, supplied all the data. Because they could get an IRB through in probably a week. Okay, <laughs> and it's not like that here. So that's where the study was done, and it met all the requirements uh, of the FDA. So your company funds the equipment and no, whatnot? You never. Never? No. When it comes to uh, uh, most of these projects, I hand make stuff ahead of time. I couldn't with the trait tube. Uh, when it came to to uh, the trait tube and that 510K, the company provided the trait tubes, period. I did the study. Yeah, I was the principal investigator. And, uh, it's satisfied. So here we have a patient. This patient right now has a salivary bypass tube in place. That's going to get replaced, okay? And that's what you see in the in this fistula. And I've got two flanges and an elastomeric cord, so you can adjust one flange closer or further away from the other flange. Next slide. So here's a handmade version. It's just a stem, 
uh, connected permanently to one flange, very soft, 20 thousandths thick, and a second flange on the other end where I reinforced it in the center so uh, it would have more drag for the tube and just a piece of silicone tubing. Next slide. And in this particular, uh, there it is in, in an adjustable form. Next slide. Um, and you can eat you know, on a fish, so this size, you just fold it up and pop it in and let it expand. Put the second flange on and draw the two flanges so you have a flange outside, flange inside, and you're sealing from the inside, but you're not obturating the opening because you want that opening to be able to heal. You should be able to see through the flange. If you want to put packing, if you want to put other things in there, a combination of this and what you traditionally do, you can do it. Next slide. Uh, Eric, if yes. it closes, how do you get the inside piece out? Okay, what we do is this. Uh, this flange comes out, and in, and in the commercially available device, which it's now through the FDA and it's coming out now, um, we have a dedicated uh, catheter that has a locking tip. You put the catheter in, up and out the mouth. It's, it's uh, a t eight, 10 French catheter. You lock the stem on what I'm about to show you on that tip, and you pull it through the mouth, out the front, put the second flange on. For taking it out, when that fistula grows closed, you put it on the stem and take it back out the way you took it in. So retrograde uh, insertion and antegrade removal, because you can take it apart. Next slide. Uh, so that's a handmade device, flange to flange. This lady, uh, you know, obviously you need to, as physicians, look at all the factors that contribute to fistulas and keep fistulas going, you know, from hemoglobin levels to, to uh, reflux. Uh, you've got to control all those things. But this lady, next slide, this is, in her case, this is about nine months later. And I don't know how many devices, because the flange is curled because of fungus on the inside, and then they leak. She can speak with her prosthesis. She, until she had active disease going on, and she died of that disease. And that's why I'm surprised that this closed in as much as it did. It never fully closed. Um, here's what it looks like from a prototype into a commercial device. Okay, well, that's still a prototype. Next slide. That's a, this is, I'll make a comment about this next. Next slide. And so this is what it looks like today. And so you have a beaded stem, and you here, this, this is permanent, all one piece, retrograde placement with the catheter lock, pull the stem down put the outer flange on, adjust it to where you don't get a leak on a sip of water, and then this is a locking loop just to put, this, put the piece through there so you have two friction points so you don't get anything backing off. Um, does this solve every fistula? Absolutely not, but I have seen and experienced some really remarkable cases. Um, a good friend of mine, Rick Barrio, who's at Loyola, yeah, he had a fellow that had a fistula for nine months, wouldn't close, sat there, just stayed the same. The patient didn't want any surgery. He had a feeding tube in place, okay? And at about nine months, Rick called me and said, this guy is so, he'll do anything to get rid of the feeding tube. So I sent Rick one of these. These come in a small, a medium, and a large, but you can trim if there's, you need something in between. Within six weeks, that fistula was closed to the point when it's down to the stem, took it out retrograde, put a bandage over it, and it closed. My feeling is, and there are lots of factors involved, my premise is, again as a speech pathologist, my experience is that if you keep a tract dry and free of contaminants, you have a much better chance of getting it to heal. Now, this is phase one. I'm in the process, and, and, and this is going to be rolled out in, within the next couple of weeks as a biflange silicone fistula device. Uh, Dan Deschler is going to be here tomorrow. If you see Dan, ask him about his patient. I mean, he's on. He's got a lady, and it's not the indications for this device. This device is for fistulas in the neck, not punctures, but people are going to use it there. He's got a, somebody with a lady with a fistula about two centimeters down the posterior trachea wall. And he's, he's on, I think, his fifth or sixth prosthesis because it curls over two years. This lady's on a normal diet, has no leakage. But she, she's not healing, but she's also eating. So, uh, normally. So, he might give you some thoughts on this. So, 
anyhow, phase two, and I'm in the process of, as a reti retiree, uh, in the process of putting together a multi-institutional clinical trial, um, just in the early stages of, of, uh, of negotiating with some folks who want to participate. Why? Because phase two is to wrap the stem, get it adjusted, you know your length, get rid of your leak, then take the front flange off and wrap the stem with extracellular matrix. And put the flange back on it. What? What is, now what does the prosthesis do? The prosthesis keeps the tract and the material dry and it keeps it in position. It's almost a scaffolding to hold extracellular matrix. So that's phase two of this project, okay? So moving along to another area. Uh, these are various physicians around the country that I made devices for, and they provided their clinical observations um, for uh, uh, my data for the FDA. Some are folks that you may or may not know. Um, okay? And that, the, the clinical data from the FDA and the physicians, surgeons who participated will be available to anybody that wants, because we don't have a publication yet. There's not a publication on this. And um, I think that that will emerge over the next year or so, and people will start to use it. And we're gonna find out whether it works as well as my experience has been. So, uh, septal button, okay, well, you know what? I have been hand making septal, I don't like to call them buttons, septal perforation processes for the surgeons in my group for 14 years. And I kept, I kept dimensions, I kept all the information in a log on every single one. And you know what I found emerged after probably 600 of these, five or 600 of them? They said, make me one that is the exact shape and the exact size of the perforation, okay? And I did as a one-piece device. Then I had a way to do that. Well, what came out after making all those devices is you really only have two, basically two shapes to perforations, oval or round. There's, there's not jaggedy stuff like this. <laughs> and the ovals, the ovals start small, and uh, I mean, the round, they start small round, and they become oval over time. I don't know why. So, um, goodness of fit is provided by having a series of devices that are oval shaped shafts and a series of devices that are round shaped shafts in different dimensions. Okay? So, there'll be about 22 devices. And then comes ease of insertion. And this is where uh, Dr. Good's magnetic septal splint got in the way, okay? Because we have figured out a process for molding magnets, very thin oval magnets and round magnets within the silicone so they don't rust. And now we have this. You pick the size, you pick the shape, and you go, and it's done. I can put one in, unless it's really posterior. I can put one in in like a minute. Okay, next slide will show this. So here's the concept. And so there, there's a two millimeter and a three millimeter in rounds and ovals. Next slide, that's the concept. Uh, so those are the oval sizes based on going back through the records, all the data that I collected all, all those years can cover just about any septal perforation uh, and any thickness of septum. Next slide. And patent stuff, next slide. And this is what it looks like. And part of the challenge was this membrane, you can encase this, this is a <coughs> size 10 round. You can have a round magnet and set it down inside a wall and it ends up being 10. But what, if you have too thick a silicone over the surface, you start to affect the magnetic strength of what you have. So we got the perfect magnetic strength it's just enough that when you blow your nose, your septal prosthesis does not end up in your soup. <laughs> that's part of it. Okay, next slide. So that's the concept. So here's the birth. And next slide. Uh, and here's the device in place. So this is not a bare magnet against a perforation. It is encased in silicone as part of the manufacturing process. Okay, next slide. Okay, so let's talk about the 
TE wall that does this, okay? But more important, I think the application for what I'm about to show you is for primary placement. You put it in under stretch, and as the, as the trauma for your original surgery, secondary or primary, starts to subside, so does the length of the prosthesis. Any of us that fit prostheses, we put one in, and two or three week, uh, weeks later, it's too long, and we have to put another one in. So you put this in under stretch. You'll see it here. So it's for that application, and also for the person with the flare. Next slide. So there's a retracted device. Next slide. Another highly retracted device, and some of them, because they don't give way, next slide, is a device that has just turned itself, and the inner flange has come through the wall. Some of you that are nodding have seen this, okay? It's just, it's, it doesn't have to be that way. Next slide. So, um, this is just what are some of the causes of uh, hypertrophy of <coughs> tracts, respiratory infection, granulation, reflux allergies, and generalizing edema, which is a nice way of saying, I don't know. Okay, next slide. Uh, and so the unique solution is a device that is like an accordion, okay? And this is not a, a deep track. People have said, oh, that's going to collect all kinds of mucus. I have put more voice prostheses in people than anybody on this planet, okay? Trust me, <laughs> that's not going to be a problem. Next slide. And where did the concept come from? Oh, yeah. One day I was sitting having lunch and there was a straw on the table. And I looked at the straw and I looked at this portion, even though it's not elastomeric, and I thought, that's the solution, okay? Isn't that not... prior art? Pardon? <laughs> yeah, it is, but only in drinking straws. <laughs> uh, <laughs> uh, <laughs> okay, so the other thing is we're going to end up with three lengths of voice prostheses. A lot of people have all these different lengths on their shelves. A six millimeter is going to go to 10. An eight millimeter is going to extend and come back to 12. And a 10 is going to go to 14. So three devices can cover the waterfront. So next slide. And there it is. This is, this is a lot thinner in this region. It's, it's, a, it's a really easy stretch. It's not something you're going to pull apart and it's going to go like that. It's an easy stretch. Next slide. And that's just, again, patent drawings. Next slide. And, okay, recurrent esophageal stricture management following total laryngectomy. Well, I think it needs to be automated. I mean, we're not talking about robotics here, okay? But I think it needs to be automated so your dilation is done in tiny little steps, like a millimeter to half a millimeter, but done automatically. And so, um, there, I know two otolaryngologists, one otolaryngologist and one uh, gastroenterologist, they dilate their patients twice a week, just a little bit, over six or eight weeks. And they seem to hold longer. I don't know if that, that's just a theory. Um, and so that's what's behind this. Less trauma to the tissue, um, maybe, a longer relief, and certainly just decreased uh, treatment costs. Because this is going to think of this as being kind of like, for laryngectomized patients, kind of like uh, renal dialysis. Once you've got your balloon dilator positioned and anchored, either through a puncture, if they have one, and up, or through the nose and down, and your balloon section is in the stricture and anchored, it then interfaces to what we call a tissue modification controller. I'm not smart enough to do this. I can, I can say, this is what I need, this is an unmet need, this is what I need, and I hooked up with two friends of mine that are engineers. And what they develop, next slide, is, we can go past that, because it's patent stuff, patent stuff. This is the controller, it's about this big, okay? and. So you've got a balloon dilator and a stretcher, and you hit the start button. And the balloon is gonna, it will die, we, are, we have it working. The balloon dilates up until it first meets resistance, the minimal resistance. Now it's against the stretcher. Now the next phase is one millimeter. And then this equipment senses when that stretcher gives way to that first step. And then it's repeated and repeat it. And so this is all automated. 
There is a big swallowing center uh, in Sydney, Australia, led by a very prominent otolaryngologist by the name of Ian Cook. And Ian Cook, I met through some, uh, a mutual friend. This is his philosophy, and he specializes in this. And so this is probably going to go to St. George's Hospital, and that's where they're going to do start clinical trials. So even if this doesn't last longer, and I believe it will, we can do it a lot cheaper because this piece of equipment we built for under $500. If you take out facility fee, if you take out anesthesia, now of course, you know, Boston Scientific will get in the way. They'll say, oh yeah, this is a nice $10,000 piece of equipment. <laughs> we try to control that. But this is a progressing uh, kind of a solution to a problem. I'd like to get to the last one because uh, we want to save room for a question or two. That's just the compression with a lot of wires and a circuit board, okay? Uh, so let's go to the last one, and then we got to get the contracts and stuff. This one is, I already gave you a little hint on, uh, an endotracheal tube with a disposable inner cannula that is suction inner cannula, so you can suction through a fenestration above a cuff and have a disposable inner cannula. But you know, to address big holes in the in the in the uh, in the um, management of ventilator-associated pneumonia, not only do you have to be able to remove that junk from in that tube that's sitting above the lungs for six or seven or eight days until the patient goes to trach, and there there's two people that have inventions out there. One is uh, a catheter that goes down through an endotracheal tube. You blow up the balloon and then you pull it back out and try to take that stuff out this way. Hmm. The other is called a, it's a brush kind of an apparatus. We know the problem exists. The simple solution, obviously the endotracheal tube, the outer tube will need to be thinner walled, but there's some really fabulous things that can be done with, with um, a wire armor now with really thin wire that is really strong. And so we think we can get to uh, both an outer cannula that is a, equivalent to current outer cannulas, and with an inner cannula still not lose the important ID that everybody thinks they need. But if, if, if you think about it, they don't have that ID because most of those tubes are loaded with junk. And when I showed that picture, probably half of you were going, yeah, seen that probably just last week. So um, to solve this problem, number one, there's already material out there called, um, um, it's a micro material. Um, Kimberly Clark has it. It is thinner than saran wrap. It has already been shown on the bench that it is so thin when it seals a wall and you put dye water on top of that cuff, nothing gets past it. Because all the micro creases are not there, okay? Now, somebody's gotta test that in a patient who's moving his head, but, Certainly, microcuff material is very important. You don't see it on trach tubes. You see it on one endotrach trach tube from Kimberly Clark. Why? Because it's $18 a cuff. You can't put an $18 cuff on a $25 trach tube or a, a $6 endotracheal tube. Well, some partners of mine have figured out how to make that same microcuff and stay out of the patent wars for about 32 cents a cuff. So we plan to put that cuff as part of a staged program on our trach tube and endotracheal tube. When you guys put women and men go in and put trach tubes in people, some of you probably get a syringe, bring up the cuff. You may listen with a stethoscope. You may say, oh, that'll be enough. You may squeeze the pilot balloon, which has been shown in studies not to do anything. It doesn't tell you anything. Um, um, and so, we have figured out a way to replace that little pilot balloon with a digital gauge that's about as big as my thumb, backlit, so you see one, two, three, four, five, until you get to that 20 to 25 range, so you know what you're putting in scientifically. And anytime a nurse comes by during the day and wants to know what's in that cuff, they don't go get a meter and connect it to figure out what's in the cuff. They just look at the gauge, press, and if it's at night, press the button so it's backlit, and they will have a chartable, defendable um, uh, cuff.
cuff pressure. You need the right seal, you need the right sealing material, okay? Uh, and you need to be able to remove those secretions that are lining the wall, and you need to be able to suction what's sitting above the cuff. And what we're gonna do as this develops over the next, um, over the next probably it will be a year and a half or so before this actually sees daylight, um, is to address major things that are not addressed right now that I am absolutely confident will impact ventilator associated pneumonia. Okay, so let's go one more. And so we know this, next one. And we know this, next one. And so here's an inner cannula, an outer cannula, a fenestration, a suction line, and the gauge, okay? And micro cuff material uh, for an affordable price. Next slide. And uh, one thing back is when to talk about patents. Granted, two of 2014, and it was in the patent office for 13 months. Huh. I've got stuff that's been in the patent office for five years and I haven't gotten an action yet. Why this got to an examiner who took it right away, agreed with everything, including the gauge, and gave, uh, awarded a patent, is still mind-boggling to me. And this may be one of the most, this may be one of my, I hope, most important patient contributions. So next slide. Um, and so this is the, on our, on our trait tube, this is the suction built into the wall of the disposable inner cannula that goes into the outer cannula. And that same concept will be built into the endotracheal tube disposable inner cannula. Next slide. And now you just see the two together, and we're suctioning. And again, you can see the band has been put inside the cuff, so we can bring the fenestration right to the edge of the cuff without interfering with its attachment to the tube. Next slide. So uh, patents, all right? Number one, don't ever disclose your idea to somebody else unless you want to give it away. Because as of not quite a year ago, the rule is first to apply. So if I say to you tonight, hey, get a cocktail, man. I got this great idea for sleep apnea. And I draw it. You can go right to your a patent attorney in the morning, tell them what you heard last night, and you will be the patent holder if they get a patent. So, and, uh, so j just remember, don't share your idea with somebody if you're serious about it, because it's gone in an instant. Number two, that's the first to file law. Number three, employ an experienced patent attorney. I have the same patent attorney in a huge Indianapolis law firm. I think there's 300 attorneys in the group. One area is patent law. And I've used the same patent attorney since 1980. He's done all my work. So this one is one you want to remember. Bring your wallet, okay? This is not for the lighthearted, let me tell you. Um, how I got from where I started to where I am today and financed it myself is beyond me. I don't know how, okay? I'm not a rich person. Uh, I didn't make a big salary, but I kept taking royalty income and plowing it into the next idea. And I, don't, I don't get this money, you know, I wasn't born you know, in, the, in the lucky sperm club. <laughs> I've earned what I have, and uh, so uh, I guess I could have. Uh, this this may be you know, so I could have said a silver spoon. Uh, but I don't know why I said that. <laughs> so, so, what are the typical fees you're, you're going to pay? What the typical fees you're going to pay? You want to do a patent search. The patent attorney will search what's there to find out that Richard Good already used magnetics to hold something in the nose in place. You're never gonna get it. But what I've applied for in the septal processes has nothing to do with magnets. It has to do with sizes and shapes and the history of hand making devices. Hey, hey Eric, can't you license it with a fee from Good? I mean, you know, <laughs> I bet you can get it cheap. <laughs> <laughs> Patents only last for 17 years. Oh, gone. Yeah. Patents only last for 17 years. Okay. So then you've got then you've got your patent guy 
writing all this stuff in patentese, and you pay for that, okay? You know, you think surgeons are, charge a lot of money, let me tell you. His hourly rate, if I told you, you fall off the chair. You've got filing fees, and you never get a patent. That's why I'm so astonished about the endotracheal tube. The people in the patent office are there to keep you from getting a patent. <laughs> they always come back after a year or two. They're so far behind the patent office. It's not uncommon for a year to two years to three years. When they finally come back with their first response, it's never we're going to give you a patent. And so now your patent attorney has to answer that and find, find stuff. And I've had things go all the way up to the highest appeal level in the patent office and finally won. But it is expensive. So then you, let's say you get your patent. Okay, you get awarded a patent. Your patent's in the U.S. All of the 43 patents or applications I filed in at least 15 other countries. So to ching, to ching, start adding it up. It's, it, this is a serious game. And this is why a lot of people can't bring something forward because you can't meet all these benchmarks to get to where you're going. Patent life is either 17 or 20 years and uh, you have to pay maintenance fees every two years. Maintenance fees uh, on a U.S. patent is about $1,500. Germany, it's got $1,700. So this is an expensive sport. And that's why a lot of people with great ideas partner with corporations, let the corporation own the patent, and you work out some kind of royalty, which takes us to the next area, next slide. Um, trademarks. Trademarks are really great. Uh, when I say... Um, that don't give away your name, you can't use your name anymore. Unless your name is uh, John um, Bogart uh, Smith Johnson, and you call the device, all of that. Because as soon as you try to use your name on a product, they look in the phone book, in the trademark office, and they say, well, there's a whole bunch of John Smiths. And so we, can't, we won't give you John Smith. But if you've got something unusual, or if you've got two people's names, Blum and Singer. And you know, back in 1980, I said to Mark, I said, yep, um, I'm going to trademark this. You call it the Blum. Because the procedure is going to be called the Singer procedure. I said, Mark, I think you're making a mistake. It's going to be called a puncture. And it is today, a puncture. So I said, it's Blum Singer. And you know what? That's a valuable piece of property today. So on the trait tube line, which has nothing to do with one company, it's with another company, I wanted to identify it. So I went in to try to get Blum, and it came back from the uh, trademark office. There's at least 40 Blums in phone boats in the United States. <clears throat> a good trademark attorney, which I have, went back in and said, yes, but Blum in ENT is known with Singer, and it's known for medical devices, and even if there's 20 there, people in the professional know Blum is Blum, and got it. So, um, but if you come up with a clever name for a device, uh, or you use, have a partner where it's two names, you can get it. Trademarks are forever. So when patents run out, you know, and somebody's helped you establish a good reputation for, let's say, Blum Singer, it, they're going to continue to pay you some, some amount over time. Next slide. And then let's talk about corporate partners. This sometimes is the biggest roadblock. Unless you are well known uh, in your profession and they seek you, okay? But if, you know, uh, in the beginning, or who are you? What's this? You don't even get in the door. It's easy for me to get in the door now because they can, they can Google me and find out that I've, I've probably done some things and had some successes. So this is tough. Um, we'll always use legal counsel. I know in this room we're probably not all fond, fond of legal counsel, but you know what? In these, in, in this stuff, if you do it, whether it's just one good idea and one medical device, you, you know you you can't live without it. Um, your credentials help you get in the door. Uh, but right now, I'm, I am knocking on the door hard with Boston Scientific for the esophageal tissue dilation controller. Already built 
ready for a free clinical trial. And, you know, you know, short of going in there and finding the president's office, I'm having, at, at my career level, having trouble. Um, don't disclose anything to any company if you get that far unless you have a patent application filed already. They always want to say, oh, let's just do an NDA, you and me, okay? That's a non-disclosure agreement that says in lots of legal legalese, you won't disclose and we won't disclose. Except they can backdate some log notes and say, oh, well, sorry, this is something we've been working on for you. So I, I never ex uh, expose anything without this, and I don't do these, because I don't think they're worth the paper they're on. Next slide. And contracts. Mm -hmm. This is where it becomes tough. I'm going to tell you, I have been in three big lawsuits. One infringement, one co uh, contract, and I can't, I tried to forget the third one. Very expensive. Um, <laughs> and <laughs> contracts always have legal, con uh, le legal counsel. Always. You know, um, what is that uh, this famous uh, American attorney who's now got a website where you can do all your own stuff? You know, I can't remember his name. But um, make sure that the licensee and the licensor have fair obligations to one another. They want to stack it against you. Okay? Uh, a timetable for the product development. If you don't have that in there, it's like saying, all right, uh, Mr. Johnson, I want you to build this house for me. Here's the design, the floor plans. We'll start on it. If you don't have, it's got to be done by so-and-so. Four, five years ago, you have no recourse. I've been in that relationship where it's taken years to bring something forward. I've, I've spent my money and my intellect. So you've got to have timetables for, all right, when you start, it has to be done by so-and-so. Uh, time. Um, you got to have a contract to commercialize stuff. You got a great idea. Everything's, everything's in place, except you don't have something in there about what their efforts are going to be, the company. What efforts are they going to put forward to, to commercialize your product? And I've had problems with that. What do you expect in terms of do, re, mi? Okay? 3%. You start doing the, I, I don't want to do the math. On some of the things that I have out there, I don't want to go back and add up because I know I'm in the hole. By the fees that I've paid, I know I'm on an item that costs $35 at 4%. Not, not a good deal. Uh, trademark royalties, you have a trademark, 1% or 2%, but it's going to go on as long as they're using the trademark. Licensee and licensor contract to term. Uh, 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 termination agreements. It's not good when they when they can eliminate you on 90 days notice and you don't have any recourse the other direction when you find that they're not. So just make sure that you employ a, con a, a, a good contract lawyer or you're going to get skinned. And a lot of professional people, myself included, who just we don't know what we're doing. I've paid to know what I've what I'm doing now. Um, a lot of, in a lot of ways, it was too late. Um, and then Dr. Song asked if I would make a couple of comments before questions, and that's about FDA. Um, FDA is getting pretty tough uh, with medical devices and other things, and uh, but they're fair. And I, I find the ENT panel to be very fair. Um, but it's a lot of work. I mean, you've got to put together good research, but in academic settings like, like this, we're expected to do that. We're expected to prove concepts. And uh, so it's just the rigors of getting IRBs and, uh, and enrolling patients and all that, but we're pretty used to that. So I find the FDA to be time-consuming, very necessary, and certainly not daunting whatsoever. It's just these things all take time. So is there another slide? I think there's not. So I would be happy to entertain a question or a comment. And if there aren't any, I'm done. Any questions? I think we got the chance up.